Thank you, team, for the kind introductions. First, I would like to thank the organizer, Time Higher Education, Kazan Federal University, and the University of Tatarstan to, give me, to invite me here, to give me an opportunity to share my thought with you. I felt like I'm speaking to a room for converts, because you clearly believe that research is important. But I will use the next 20 minutes try to tell you, you know, a little bit history about the Baron Row. Oops, it's here. A little bit history about the uh, Baron Row. I'm sure you're very familiar with already. And then the uh, why we is important. It's not really for ranking, but for you know the for the uh, nation and the people. More important, I'll discuss with you the way forward and share with you the experience that we have in the Hong Kong Polytech University, what we call ourselves the PolyU, and then the conclusion. Well, um, the Bell and Road Initiative, as you may know, started by you know, uh, our, the Chairman uh, Xi Jinping of China um, in 2013. Uh, right here at the, uh, well, not this university, but in Eurasia area, Nasabarev University. And you have five initiative, policy coordination, facility connectivities, trade investment, financial integration, cultural exchange. None of these really, I guess you can argue that cultural exchange is somewhat related to, you know, university educators, the rest mainly is infrastructure building on, you know, uh, investment. The initiative actually involves six economic corridors spanning Asia, Europe, Africa. Well, I'm not here to really to elaborate on all the initiatives and I'm sure you can find them, okay. Uh, in the internet, uh, look up the right uh, uh, sources. The Silk Road or the Belkin Road or One Belkin Road actually is a very old concept. When I dig up, the, I had to say, I mean, I learned this when I was a kid in uh, learning Chinese history in Hong Kong. And when I prepare the, uh, the slide and I go back and look it up, it actually go back to 300 BC. And there are, in fact, many trade routes at that time. The Silk Road between Babylon and China is just one of the major ones. And I was surprised to learn that they actually route, you know, along the sea too at the time. And the so-called Belt and Road, the Belt is on land, the so-called Silk Road Economic Belt, and the Road is the Maritime Silk Road. It's the modern version of it. More surprising is that in the so-called Belt and Road Initiative, it actually, this list, uh, I apologize for the small print, don't mean for you to really read them, just to show you how many countries involved. This list is taken from the Trade Development Council of Hong Kong um, in the middle of August, and the list 75 countries and two so-called special economic zones, that's Hong Kong and Macau in China. Amazing, uh, I find that they list New Zealand there. So I guess they don't really follow exactly you know, uh, history. I don't think uh, we trade with New Zealand there at that time. Jokes aside, Tim mentioned this you know, in, in his introductions. Um, this region, the Baron Road region, cover 65, 3, 65% of the world population. About one third of the world merchandise trade and one third of the world GDP. Now the key point is, we have 65%, 63% of the world population, but less than half, one third of the world GDP. So in a way, if you look at it, this region had been underperformed in the economics of the world. And the question is why? And my take on the situation, my argument will be that 
perhaps we are slow in research, more in particular in innovation and technology. Here I'm going to argue that innovation technology is the most important, actually, to the strategic interest of a nation and the well-being of its people. And the first is my argument. Well, mankind, in a way, mankind invent technology develop all the time. But there is a period there is explosion of technology, both in the quality and the quantity. As you all know, it's called Industrial Revolution. It starts around the 1750s. It's a time that when finally mankind you know, are released from animal power, you know, uh, from uh, the uh, beasts of labor, horses, oxes, you know, even uh, human beings ourselves, you know, uh, doing all the hard labor work. To go from one place to another, either you walk with your two feet, okay, or you, know, you take a horse you know, to pull your cart. If you're near the seaside, then you ride sailboat. But even if you're sailboat, you know, you're in the mercy of the nature, of the wind and, and, and the rain and everything. During the you know, Industrial Revolution, this when animal power is replaced by steam power in the beginning and electric power afterwards. And you still remember in the old Western movie, you have horses racing uh, against the you know, uh, steam uh, locomotive at that time. Of course, nobody there do any more with the high-speed rail today. And also, we see during the Industrial Revolution, you know, hand tools replacing machines. These are really huge changes. These change the, the way that we live, we work, change the world order. Many thesis, research, you know, and <clears throat> papers are written on the Industrial Revolution. Here, I just want to share with you, you know, what I get in the web. The share of the global economy of a few countries. In this case, it is China, India, the US, Britain, and Japan. Now, first, this type of numbers, okay, the best is, you know, so-called guesstimate. Even today, it's very really hard to estimate correctly. You know, I'm no economist, okay, I'm a physicist by training. But what I learned is that even today, how to evaluate you know, a country's share of the economy, you know, you have different school of uh, thought. So let's don't take this number really literally, but look, look at it more qualitatively. You look at China and India, the red curve and the orange curve, okay, on the screen. Before the Industrial Revolution roughly start around 1750, when the first you know, uh, steam engine are uh, being uh, invented, actually China and India together account for more than half of the world economy. Actually, if you go to the web, look up the uh, data, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. see that you know, for some of those, they show that even back to you know, uh, uh, the, the first AD, I mean, China and India had you know, lion's share of, of the world economy. And it wax and wane, you know, depends on the change in dynasty and so on, but it is, you know, the you know, major economic power in the world. But starting around the Industrial Revolution, you, you see a sharp decline in the share, okay? And of course, together, you know, there are wars, you know, uh, all kind of, you know, uh, political upheaval, at least in China. And for China, it hit, you know, the Qing Dynasty disintegrate, you know, uh, in the early 1900s, and the uh, share of the world economy hit rock bottom less than 5%, you know, around 1950s, during the high time of the so-called Cultural Revolution. And India sort of follows similar path. And I attribute this to the Chinese missing out on the Industrial Revolution. And although, you know, this very long story, gunpowder, you know, and among other things, you know, invented in China. It, you know, go west and then turn into cannons and go into China and, you know, blow the door open, so to speak. So this is missing out on research, particularly applied research. But in particular, you know, innovation technology, you know, could have a very serious consequence to the country, to the nation, and its people. 
Now the industrial revolution do not stop, you know. It actually accelerate in something that we call the information revolution. Well, it depends how you, how you market. Uh, I market start around 1950s, when the first you know, uh, computer chips you know, were very rudimentary form, the socket joints are being you know, invented. Come the uh, optical fiber, my field research, laser in the 1960s, then the personal computer in the 1980s, of course, before that, wireless communication. And today, you know, uh, I was joking before uh, this start that, you know, everybody cannot, you know, uh, stop looking at their cell phone. Okay, you multitask. Uh, it used to be considered very impolite, but now everybody is doing that. So, this information revolution that we experience nowadays changed the way we communicate, how we, co how we network, how we talk to people. And distance no longer issue. You can always, you know, get in touch. And with social media, you know, come a new brand of presidency in the United States in the form of, you know, Donald Trump. What does that do to the shared global economy? It may be coincident. It may also be, you know, uh, 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 it's hard to, you know, prove causality. But you look at China, its share of the global economy start to grow, you know, in the late 70s, slowly, and then, you know, have a remarkable turnaround. And, well, in this curve, it's so that, you know, the share economy of, you know, um, US and China actually meet around uh, 2015. Uh, well, as I said, you don't take this number very seriously. But uh, in terms of GDP, uh, China's now uh, GDP is about two-thirds of that of the United States. And their argument from some economists that in real buying power, the Chinese uh, GDP actually is equivalent, the economy is equivalent that of the US. But then, I'm, again, I'm low economist. But you look at the top 10 most richest company, okay, uh, in the world, uh, three of them are Chinese companies. I got it from the web last night. And they're not, your, not what you thought, okay, it's not high-tech company. It's the, your, your traditional, you know, uh, one, one is a utility company, a power grid company, and then two of them are petrol company. But they, I think they rank second, third, and fourth. And you double talk uh, tech companies, the top 10 tech company in the world, two of them are from China. Okay, your Alibaba and your Tencent. They do not exist 15 years ago. So I hear argue that the Chinese ride on the information revolution. And I'll later on explain why they can do that, okay? Because sometimes legacy don't help you. The fact that, you know, China missed out you know, on the industrial revolution do not really hinder them from getting on you know, the information revolutions. So the Chinese uh, economy rise up, okay? And then you see that, you know, that India also go up. Again, the progress of technology and innovation have not stopped. Many now argue that we are in the beginning of so-called artificial intelligence or AI revolution. In this revolution, it's very scary when machine intelligence you know, finally, you know, overtake human intelligence. I'm sure you are aware of AlphaGo. It's an amazing feat of defeating the world winning gold champion. A game that when Kasparov, you know, got beaten by Deep Blue in 1997 in chess, it was argued that, you know, it would take AI more than 30 years to do that. And in, fa uh, in fact, you know, it take less than that. How this will play out, how this will affect, you know, the world order, we don't really know. But one thing that I argue is that no countries, particular countries in this region, in Eurasia, can miss out on the coming, you know, uh, AI revolution. Now, how do we catch that? You come back to, you know, the nature of research. We talk, we talk a lot about research. I do research my, myself personally. I'm still doing, you know, uh, a small research program. But when you go to academics, they like to talk about basic research, blue sky research. Okay? And they talk about that with a sense of pride. When you talk about applied research, they feel that they become second class. They have research that 
like basic research, will take a long time to come. I'm sure you're aware of you know, the uh, detection of the gravitational wave. It's 100 years in coming after Einstein predictions. And short-term research, that's more applied in nature, take 5 to 15, 20 years. There are research that you know, will bring on disruptive changes, pile on a lot of incremental work. There are research that will take you know, expensive equipment, multi lectional collaboration. And there are research that is more talent intensive. You need a sharp mind. What I'm going to argue is that as an individual, yeah, up to you know, any professor who wants to pursue blue sky research or apply that research. But for a nation, for society, we cannot afford our best and brightest mind just pursue anything that you know, uh, caught their fancy. And to do that, proper incentive have been set up you know, in the country, in the society, to reward those who do research that have impact to the society. What kind of research will there be in the next, oops, sorry, in the next 10, 15 years? I took this, you know, liberally from, you know, uh, a talk, you know, uh, from the uh, Professor uh, Tan Tien Niu. He's the Deputy Chair of the Liaison Office of Central Government in the Hong Kong uh, Special Minister. He so here, he lists out eight, you know, area of research area that, you know, not just basic research that will be important. Well, first, clearly cutting edge basic research, quantum physics, quantum computing, quantum encryption, quantum communication, you know, clearly with area, brain research, genomics, cosmology, dark matters, you know, origin of the universe, fate of universe will be this line of work. What we call, I guess, basic research. Then you have advanced technology research, go deep, you go deep space, deep ocean, you go deep into the earth crust, or deep blue. The not the picture on, on the right, okay, is that deep blue. Deep blue is the machine or computer program, IBM that used to be, you know, um, uh, Kasparov. Of course, green and health technology is important. Okay, uh, we have our air is polluted. Well, not here. Uh, in Hong Kong, Beijing, Shanghai, the air is polluted. Water is polluted. Uh, carbon emissions, all these need to be solved. And health, aging problem uh, in, the, in the society. In Hong Kong, you know, in a uh, couple of years' time, one in four will be over 60. In another uh, uh, 12 years' time, you know, one in three will be over 65. And many societies facing a, a huge aging problem, and together with that, there was a health problem. So the good area of research. Internet of Things, first internet for people, then Internet of Things. If they come big data, big data have prompt a lot of research area, very prominent, and big data actually have driven you know uh, company like Alibaba and Tencent, you know, into you know uh, world uh, world class companies. AI, we talked about that already. Um, in a report from Oxford University uh, last year, it predicted 40% of the job type in the world would disappear in 15 years. Now, how true that is, we don't know. But judging from you know, the industrial revolution, the information revolutions, we know that you know, a lot of jobs will be replaced. And I'm sure new jobs will be created. And that poses a lot of challenge to to the government and also as to us educators. These are just, you know, uh, uh, an estimate on the impact of various technology, okay, on, you know, uh, the economies, okay. I won't go into details here. Last one, to make this all happen, you, we need intellectual collaborations. We need, you know, uh, the, the old days that, you know, people, you know, just, you know, uh, work on their own uh, in, in the garage, you know, this model, you know, make good story make good movies, doesn't really work anymore. So what should we do from here? Well, we should drive impactful research, 
particular innovation technology. As I argue, we are on the verge of the third technology revolution that will definitely polarize the world. Those who caught on, okay, to, to catch on the uh, new uh, directions who you know, uh, prosper, those, those who do not, you know, run serious problems. Look at what happened to China, missing out the industrial revolutions. For research, I argue that, you know, perhaps, you know, not many countries should go for equipment intensive research, but rather talent intensive. Disruptive nature of new technology means that sometimes legacy achievement might not be very help, might not be very useful. I work in optical fiber communication. When I returned to Hong Kong to work in the mid uh, 1990s, the commercial infrastructure in China is actually very backward. Okay, and so what do they do is that they install optical fiber directly. They skip. They go from twisted pair. Uh, twisted wire, skip the coaxial cable and go directly into optical fibers. You go to the US, in the Midwest, there are still people, you know, using, you know, coaxial cable because it's there. The legacy system actually slow down, you know, the penetration of optical fiber networks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, showing that, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, being ahead, sometimes slow you down for the next wave. And it happened a lot in technology. I share you a little bit on our experience in uh, our university. Uh, we are 81 years old. We start out not as a university. In 1937, we start a common trade school and then go through a technical college, a polytechnic, and eventually become a university in you know, uh, 1994. So as a university, we are only 24 years old. Our strategy in the last 10 years is to build collaboration you know, on applied research you know, with big corporations. So in the pictures here, you saw, you know, the high-speed well. Uh, we involved in the high-speed authority in China. All the well system in Hong Kong have our uh, fiber optics based uh, sensor system there. And we recently saw our system with Singapore. I hope no one from Singapore here. Singapore have a very good university, and their research in optical fiber sensors are very good. But when we come to their own SMLT, their local metro system, need a uh, structural health monitoring system, they come to us at uh, University in Hong Kong for help because we focus on not just publishing a paper, but bring the research to, you know, applications. You probably do not know that, you know, we develop drugs in Hong Kong. Three of them, three drugs in Hong Kong are now in the clinical trial status, all from our university because we don't have medical school. Our chemists and our biologists work together. They're in the same department, we're a small school. And then they develop free drugs. There are two instruments from Hong Kong now is out of this world, literally. One in Mars, one in the moon. Again, design made in local university, our university. A lot of this work, you know, writing a paper is easy. But taking the, the so-called uh, demonstration principle of feasibility study type of research into, you know, real practice, take a lot more work that might not be able to publish and be counted. And the tower you saw, the TV tower you saw on the right is the Guangzhou TV tower, second tallest tower you know, in, uh, in the world. Uh, from construction to operation, they have our sensor there. It's the only structure of its kind. They have 724 monitoring and with data on the web accessible to all researchers who are interested in doing research in large structures. Again, you know, from our university. So I want to show that, you know, um, as a university, we should drive, you know, not just research publication, but research paper, that you know, research work that actually have an impact on the society and that can be done. Now for the way forward, very important that we need to nurture talent. There's a lot of doubt about, you know, young talent leaving their home, home country homeland, you know, pursue, you know, R&D studies, you know, in, in other parts of the world, in the so-called brain drain problem. You look at Taiwan, you look at China, we ran through that experience. I, I went to the United States study in 1981, and together with, from Hong, I from Hong Kong, and together with the first wave of Chinese students going to the U.S., 
to study at the time. There's a lot of debate in China whether you know, uh, we are, you, they are losing the best and the brightest you know, to the US that way. But after 20 years, a lot of these students actually move back you know, to China and help build, help push through the technology revolution that they experience. So I argue that you know, in, a, in a world, particularly in a world uh, today, when you have uh, commercial technology so, so easy, you know, having your young and brightest you know, to go abroad to study you will actually benefit your society. And Eurasia, with its huge market populations okay, in talent pool, you could certainly capitalize on these opportunities. A quick you know, um, advertisement, our university actually support a few, not too many. We have students from uh, Kazakhstan, Pakistan, Russia. Uh, we are trying to do, and the feedback from the students is really positive. And we hope you know, use opportunity here to you know, enlarge you know, that uh, uh, collaboration exchange. For the way forward, the third part is that we need partnership. As I said earlier, okay, the days that you know, uh, someone you know, uh, uh, work in the garage and then come up with a technology that will change the world, I can't say that it will not happen, but the chance of it happening again is very slim. You need collaborations. It's a question on the description of this session, asking about you know, whether you know, uh, this region, Eurasia, you know, should collaborate with the East, or with the West or the Far East. I don't see anything wrong about collaboration with the West or the Far East, as long as the collaboration is mutual, mutual beneficial it's not, and it's not you know, exploitative. Because working with the best is always the quickest way to go to the top. Okay? We learned that since we were young. And seek for partners both inside and outside region clearly is the, is the right way to go. And uh, just for example, I mean, uh, we do our share in Poly U, you know, uh, to start a uh, different program. The picture here shows you know, uh, our engineering school. We work with you know, Xi'an Jiao Tong, <coughs> Xi'an Jiao Tong University, uh, uh, State Grid, uh, uh, and the Hong Kong Electric you know, uh, on the <coughs> uh, at once professional development program in power and energy. It's mutually beneficial. We also build partnership with, uh, on the top left corner, uh, Boeing Company. The two acronym, HECO HESO, are two um, intellectual aviation MRO. MRO stands for Maintenance Repair 04 Company for aircraft. Uh, we have built partnership with them to form a research center in Hong Kong. We have food safety program. Uh, we work with you know, uh, Denmark, uh, with, uh, Italy, and uh, Sweden. Uh, we have joined with Huawei. We have joined with Alibaba. So we do build partnership ourselves. So I think my time is going to come up. Um, the takeaway or the conclusion okay, is that research, in particular innovation and technology, do determine the faith of nations and their people. I hope I convinced you that you know, missing out on a, a nation, missing out on technology you know, and development could have very dear consequence. No one in China again yeah, missing out on the Industrial Revolution. And we are on the verge of a new one, a very scary one. One that machine intelligence we're going to take over, you know, human intelligence. This region, Eurasia, had the talent, had the people, brain power is important here, and more important, had the market. Research across zero certainly is a new pathway to excellence. Thank you very much.